guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and I am joined by a very special guest, Vanessa, for a conversation about the work and the tragic, mysterious death of Thelma Todd. Vanessa, welcome to Serial at Midnight. Thank you very much, Heath. I am very excited to be here. And just talking about this subject, I am so, so freaking amped for this conversation. I mean, I don't know anybody that loves classic movies as much as you do. And just in conversations in passing, I'm like, you just know so much. This is an area of intense passion for you. We're talking specifically, I guess we're talking about like the mid to late 20s into the 30s for today's video, Thelma Todd. Um, Maybe we should start with, for our audience, that we're going to get into some conspiracy theories, some death theories, some true crime conversation, but who is Thelma Todd? How would people know who she is? Well, that's the thing. I don't think very many people do know who she is. Um, So Thelma Todd, she tragically passed away at the very young age of 29, uh, and it was very mysterious. And she she wanted to be a school teacher uh, when she was growing up. So acting was the furthest thing from her mind. Um, She ended up entering a beauty contest in her home state of Massachusetts, and she she won. Uh, And that's kind of what kickstarted her entry into Hollywood. So, you know, at these beauty contests, you had all these scouts there looking for for new personalities. So that was her entry point into Hollywood. um, And she eventually did move to Los Angeles. She was signed by Paramount to begin with. And then she eventually moved on to Hal Roach Studios and she became a very famous, very popular comedian. And Hal Roach Studios, it's not like MGM or Universal or Warner Brothers. It wasn't this massive studio uh, where you had sound stages that that lasted for acres of land. Uh, Hal Roach Studios was very small, but still very successful. They had people signed like Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chase and Thelma Todd, Zazu Pitts, like their roster was so good. And everyone there was so tight because it was a small studio. So what used to happen there was if let's say Thelma Todd was on set waiting for one of the shots on her film to be set up. And usually that took about a couple of hours to to set up a shot. Uh, So when she was bored, she would go next door to see who was filming next door to her. And if they needed some extras for a scene, she would join in. So oftentimes in these Hal Roach movies and shorts, you would see Laurel and Hardy uh, like amongst the extras on someone else's movie. So they all worked together and they all lended a hand to each other. And it was just a very familial atmosphere rather than like I said before, MGM, where everyone is spread apart and no one really interacts that much together. Let me ask, so let me ask you this, because I think you're a good person to ask this question to. There's an allure to, I'm going to say, 30, let's focus on 30s cinema, because we're in the sound era and we're getting into the bigger, you know, the, the stars that people recognize. You know, she's in Cary Grant's first movie. Um, he's a, Actually, I should say maybe he's in her... He, his first movie is a Thelma Todd vehicle, right? It's not like he's the, like it's a, she's more of a focus than he is, I think. But what is it? There's an allure. There's a charm. There's a, there's something about those movies that I do not think lasted beyond the thirties. It changed, you know, but there's something pure. There's something magical that I connect to, but I don't know that I can articulate it. Do you have any idea what it is? To me, and I suppose this answer would be different for everyone, but to me, it looked like films of that era, because Hollywood was still relatively new, and so was the studio system in the late 20s and early 30s, people were experimenting more, and they just seemed to be having so much fun on set. Mm -hmm. Things were a lot less rigid. Mm -hmm. There's a playfulness to it. And I, I'm often like I've been saying for a while now that uh, it was all done by the 30s. I mean, it's it's weird to think that because it's, you know, 
cinema, of course, goes back earlier than the 30s. But I feel like the 30s is kind of this pinnacle of what I would consider the golden age of Hollywood. And by the end of the 30s, I mean, you look at the the span. You've got the Universal Monsters. You've got the huge musicals that they were doing with, I mean... You take James Cagney out of the like the the you dirty rat that put him in a musical dudes dancing and like huge choreography. The you end with the Wizard of Oz, you end with Gone with the Wind. I mean, this decade of cinema is so alluring. And Thelma Todd is one of the brightest stars in that decade. Um, let's reference some people to her work really quick. So uh, our friends at Classic Flicks recently put out this is the uh, the Thelma Todd and Patsy Kelly shorts. These are Hal Roach. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. Uh, this comes after uh, Thelma Todd's partnership with Zesu Pitts. Absolutely hilarious stuff. I mean, people, if, if people want to be like, oh, I don't, how funny could it be? It's, it's really funny, right? Okay, let me tell you. Yes. So everyone, when you think of comedic shorts, you think of people like Laurel and Hardy, uh, Buster Keaton, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd even. Rarely do people think of female comedians. And Thelma Todd and Zazu Pitts, they made, I think it's uh, 17 comedic shorts at Hal Roach Studios. And these are hilarious. Like, like Heath said, you go in expecting, okay, this is gonna be a little tame because it's two women. No, that's not the case. In some of their shorts, you can actually see them covered in bruises. Like their arms are just riddled with dark spots and so are their legs because this is very physical, comedic, um, just zaniness. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that when Thelma Todd started doing the shorts after her period with Zazu Pitts, when she started working with Patsy Kelly, when Patsy Kelly was filming their first short together, she was ready to quit after just the one uh, because she didn't realize how physical these shorts were going to be. Like she just said, by day one, she was wiped out. She was exhausted. And, and these women did it every day. Mm -hmm. Incredible stuff. Um, yeah. But I think that most people, th so the Marx Brothers collection. So there are two movies that she's in. A lot of people have been buying this lately because the price dropped around uh, Black Friday. And it's been... I've seen a lot of people talk about picking it up and uh, it's monkey business and horse feathers both feature Thelma Todd. And this is a great place. I mean, in the U S right now, as we're making this video, this is like 15 bucks for five Marx brothers movies on Blu-ray. So oh, guys don't even think, just get it. Don't sleep. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so wonderful talent. Um, we can't even do justice to what a wonderful talent. I mean, she, you watch Thelma Todd. She's a star. She is, the camera is just like in love with her. She's she could do the glamour stuff. She could do comedy. She could do. I really feel like she was. Um, see, and I want to go off on a whole other thing. I'm gonna have to restrain myself. But I feel like there was there are qualities from those that era of actors, right? That we don't have anymore. Like you really feel like some of these people could do anything. Be like, hey, Thelma Todd, could you give us like a five minute dance? And she could just do it. There'd be no problem. Yeah. Um, but this story does not have a happy ending, and that's kind of the. I guess that's the focus for our video here is that this is one of the most notorious um, murder. Well, that's the question. Is it was Thelma Todd murdered? And maybe this is where I should hand it off to you. OK, so let me preface this by saying that there are a lot of questions surrounding her death. So if someone's watching this and and I've said something incorrectly or I got a fact wrong, please like let us know in the comments. Feel free because there's no way they will anyone could get all this all these details straight in their minds right. because this is just to put it bluntly, this case was a mess. And a lot of cases in the early 1920s, uh, leading on into the 30s in Hollywood were messes too because the studios were so big and they had so much control. Uh, if I were to put this another way, let me just say that there were more movie houses in the United States than there were banks. Okay. So wow. that's how much money studios made during this era. So they were very careful to wipe out any um, controversial 
information that may come to light to the public. They did, they wanted Hollywood to seem like some perfect utopia to their audience when really it wasn't. You had stars dying all the time of drug overdoses, alcoholism, uh, venereal disease. Like it was, it was very corrupt Hollywood. But that in and of itself is kind of the appeal as well, because there is the glitzy, I know for me at least, there's the glitzy, glamorous surface, and then there's the decay underneath. And that duality is so fascinating to me. Yeah, and that plays a huge role in her death, unfortunately. So, Thelma Todd was an actress. We all know this. Uh, she was superb on the screen. But in August 1934, so about a year and a half before her death, she opened up a sidewalk cafe, so a restaurant in, uh, in Malibu, and it's along the Pacific Coast Highway. If you go there today, the building is still there. Uh, it's still all original. I'm not sure about the inside, but the outside is exactly how it looked when Thelma Todd had her restaurant there. So she opened up a restaurant with her business partner, Roland West. And Roland West used to be a film director in the 1920s. And Thelma actually worked for him once before on a film. So they knew each other beforehand and they thought it would be uh, very lucrative to open a restaurant together because you had Roland West knew, was a little older than Thelma Todd. So he knew the ins and outs of accounting and management and all that stuff. And she was the star power. She's what drew people to the restaurant. And it was called Thelma Todd's Sidewalk Cafe. And it was situated along the Pacific Coast Highway at the bottom of a very steep hill. And up that hill is a staircase of 271 concrete steps. So it went from the bottom of the hill where her cafe was all the way to the top. And at the top of the hill is where she had her garage. And this is where she stored her vehicle and where her business partner, Roland West, stored his as well. It's a two-car garage. So that's the setting. And she lived in the apartment right above the restaurant. Uh, and her apartment was right next door to her business partner, Roland West. And the only thing separating their two apartments was a wooden sliding door. So anything that went on in either one of their apartments, you could easily hear because there was just a sliding door separating the two of them. So the mafia, they wore, they had their hands in- Be careful. Red. Don't get us in trouble with the mafia. It's okay. I'm Italian. I'm Italian. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's gangsters that had their hands in everything along the East Coast. And when they saw how much money there could be made in Hollywood, that's when they started thinking, okay, what would happen if we moved to the West Coast and we started infiltrating their unions and uh, their movie houses and their drug dens? Because drugs were very, very common in Hollywood, especially for women, because they had these clauses in their studio contracts that said if they gained more than five pounds, they would be let go. Their contract would be null and void. They had to look skinny on screen. So a lot of female actresses um, took drugs to keep slim. And, and this, the same was, uh, it was the same for Thelma Todd. She got hooked, unfortunately, on diet pills because she did have a fluctuating weight problem uh, where she easily gained weight. So you have someone like Lucky Luciano. So Charles Lucky Luciano, who made it very big in Chicago, New York, he came to Hollywood because he wanted to get involved in Hollywood's uh, drug cartel and prostitution rings and also gambling. And somehow the two of them met up. So Thelma and Luciano met up and he saw how successful her restaurant was. And there was, her restaurant was on the bottom floor. Her apartment was on the second floor. And on the third floor, there, it was just an empty storage room. And she had wanted to open up a higher class steakhouse just for celebrities to eat at. And Luciano heard about this and he said, no, no, I want the third floor for a gambling den and you're gonna open it up for me. Like the, no questions asked. He was not gonna take no as an answer. And Thelma being 
she had the kind of personality where if she didn't like something or she knew something wasn't right, she would speak up. And a lot of her friends vouched for that. Um, unfortunately, after she died and the trial went on, a lot of her friends said that this is not the kind of woman who would just sit back and let someone control her. That a total opposite. Uh, Thelma was a firecracker. And if she was opposed to anything, she was going to let people know it. So she adamantly refused to make the third floor of her cafe a gambling den. And she went ahead with her plans to open, open up a steakhouse. So now she ended up dying on, well, her body was discovered on Monday, December 16th. On Saturday night, the Saturday night previous, so two days before, she went to a Hollywood party with, that was being hosted by Stanley Lupino, Ida Lupino's father. And Ida Lupino was actually at this party. And the party was at the Trocadero, which was a very famous Hollywood haunt. So they were all at this party. Everyone saw Thelma there. Um, by the time she left, she was not drunk. And that's very important. Uh, her friends who were with her at the party testified that when she left, she had only drunk about one to two glasses of champagne. And that was nowhere near enough to let someone get like completely drunk. Mm -hmm. And she had hardly eaten that night as well. Uh, it was a very small dinner. Basically, the whole point of this party was just to, to have fun and dance and uh, welcome the holidays that were quickly approaching. So she ended up leaving this party at about, I would say, between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. early Sunday morning. No one saw her again or no one reported seeing her again until her body was found on Monday by her personal maid. So where was she on Sunday? That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, she was supposed to be working at the restaurant from Sunday morning to Sunday evening. And her partner, Roland West, who was running the restaurant with her, never reported her missing. Like if she was supposed to be running the restaurant that day, you'd think, wouldn't he think it was unusual if she never showed up to work? And he lived in the apartment next door to hers. Wouldn't he go over there and see, okay, you know, maybe she slept in, whatever. No, he, he never reported her missing. He never reached out to her mother, who she was very close to, and who she spent the Saturday afternoon with Christmas shopping before she went to the party uh, at the Trocadero. So that in itself is very unusual. If your business partner doesn't show up to work for an entire day, I mean, what would you do? Yeah. So her personal maid, whose job it was to report to work on Monday morning, would go to the garage that was up the hill from the cafe, start Thelma's car and drive it down the hill for her, park it in front of the restaurant so that Thelma could have her car at any time during the day. So that was her first duty. Her maid opened the garage door and found Thelma inside her car uh, at first, she thought she was just passed out, but then she noticed that Thelma's skin was crimson. Her entire body was crimson red. And, you know, that's not natural. Mm -hmm. So she called Roland West right away. She went down the 271 steps to the restaurant at the bottom of the hill, got Roland West and like, like, listen, Thelma's in the garage in her car. Something is wrong. Can you come up? So they went up the hill to the garage. And that's when Roland West discovered that she was dead. Um, she had blood under her nose and around her mouth, and some of it had gone onto her gown. And stupidly, he wiped it away. Like, th that's the thing in early Hollywood. By the time the cops were called, the crime scene had been tampered because so many other people showed up, the, the studio people, her mother showed up, the maid was there, her business partners came, some friends from up the hill. Like you had all these people tampering with the evidence. And the only thing that the police could do at that point was dust for fingerprints because they didn't have all the scientific knowledge that we have today. And if the only thing they could do was dust for fingerprints, that was pointless too, because there were so many people in the crime scene. Um, so the coroner was called and 
right away he said, oh, no, it's suicide. She, she probably went in the garage, turned on the car and was poisoned by carbon monoxide. So they, that was the first thing on the coroner's report. Oh, she died of suicide. No, her friends that were with her on the Saturday night at the Trocadero all came forward and said, that is not the case. She was not suicidal. She was not depressed. She had a Christmas presents in her car trunk ready to be delivered to her family and friends and the people she worked with. There's no way that this woman committed suicide. There was no note, nothing. So then the coroner was pressured to say, okay, let's do an autopsy and let's see what we find. And this whole time, the district, the district attorney was being controlled by Luciano because lucky Luciano had his hands in everything at this point in Hollywood. And he had two of his people working in the district attorney's office. So they were obviously paying the DA to cover details. Um, so... Wow. The second coroner report after the autopsy said, oh, okay, it was an accidental death. She, she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. It wasn't intentional. She probably just got home that night on Saturday night from the party, um, was locked out of her apartment. So she figured, okay, you know, I'll just stay in my car in the garage until morning and keep warm in there knowing that she would have had to walk up 271 concrete steps in an evening gown and high heels in December. Like I know this is Hollywood, but it's still freezing in December, especially at night. Yeah. Um, so, so even then that sounded strange to her friends too. Like, why would she do that? There's no way she would have made it up all these steps. And that's actually something to keep in mind because I'll come back to that later. Okay. Uh, so they reported it as accidental by carbon monoxide poisoning. But then in the autopsy, they found that there were bruises around her neck. Two of the ribs on her right side were fractured and her nose was broken. So Sounds it's like definitely a to me. No, just kidding. Yeah. It's definitely not suicide at this point. Mm -hmm. Could have been accidental, but how do you break your own ribs and your own nose? So the coroner was like, well, it's very easy to do that because you know she could have been overcome by the fumes and her head could have come forward and hit the steering wheel and then her nose would have been broken. Okay, but she wasn't found behind the steering wheel of her car. Mm -hmm. So if she had fallen forward, she wouldn't have hit the steering wheel with her face. She was actually sitting, you know, back then cars had like a single bench in the front and back. There was no armrest in between. She was almost placed in the middle of the bench. So to the, to the right of the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. So that was suspicious in and of itself. But then the coroner uh, analyzed the food that was found in her stomach, knowing that she had gone to a party on the Saturday night. And he said, okay, this is what we found. We found alcohol in her system enough to make her really drunk, which her friends said she was not drunk. And we found peas and carrots undigested in her stomach. And that's when her friends really said, okay, something is going on because at the Trocadero, she did not eat peas and carrots. None of us did. That was not served. So everyone knew at that point that she didn't die that Saturday night, early Sunday morning. She must have gone somewhere else to have another meal and to possibly drink some more. It was theorized that if she had gone up to the garage to keep warm until someone could let her into a, her apartment the next morning, she had to have climbed 271 concrete steps. She was wearing high-heeled sandals. So to test that out, the LAPD got a female police officer to put on high heels and climb the 271 steps to see if it was possible for a woman to do that. Again, there was no question that a man could do it, but let's see if a woman could do it. So the female police officer put on her high heels, went up the steps and said, yes, it is possible. She was very winded, but she did it. Mm -hmm. But one thing she noticed was that the bottom of her shoes were scuffed up a lot because the steps were concrete. And I mean, making your way up almost 300 steps, you're gonna scuff the bottom of your shoes. So then when the police took a picture of Thelma's shoes, 
the bottoms were not scuffed at all. They had they had just regular markings of a night out. So dancing, um, they weren't dirty at all. None of her, uh, none of what she was wearing was dirty. Her hair was perfect, still in curls, all set, very shiny. If she had climbed 300 steps at night in December, her hair would have been windswept. She would have been sweaty. Her gown would have been ruffled or creased. No, there was none of that. Her clothes were in perfect condition and so were the bottoms of her shoes. So now the big mystery is where was she after she left the Trocadero um, until her body was found on the Monday morning? Where was she on Sunday? That whole day that she was missing and no one reported her. Um, had she gone with someone else to another party? Had she gone to a friend's house? Had she gone to Luciano's house or something? Mm -hmm. um, and I actually want to say this book. So this book was written in 1989 and it's called Hot Toddy. It's written by Andy Edmonds. This is a phenomenal book. But there's one thing you have to consider. No one knows the exact details of her death. So you have to kind of read this and take it with a grain of salt. Um, if what's presented in this book is correct, then it makes 100% perfect sense. Her death makes sense. You know exactly what happened, if this is correct. And one of the things I want to point out about this book is because it was written in 1989, a lot of the people that Thelma was friends with and who worked with, and a lot of the gangsters who were mentioned in this book were still alive, or at least their family members were. So the author had the chance to interview some of the actual people that were involved and or their family members to get the whole story. So that's why I think above all the books that were written about Thelma Todd, I think this is the most accurate we're gonna get in terms of what happened. Um, so there's three theories, suicide, accidental death, or murder. Personally, I believe it was murder because she was being pressured to open this gambling den by Luciano. She kept saying no, refusing, and he just to get her out of the way, he ordered a hit on her and someone killed her. That was the end of that. There's, there's no way at this point that mm -hmm. anyone will know exactly what happened. But again, in that book, Hot Toddy, um, she, the author paints a very clear picture of what could have happened. Mm -hmm. And it does sound reasonable. Like it doesn't sound far fetched. Yeah. Uh, when I was reading it, honestly, I was crying for how emotional I was and how upset I was because you have this 29 year old, supremely talented actress who no one had a negative word about. No one ever spoke negatively about her. And she just, her life was snuffed out because she said no to these gangsters who were trying to intimidate her and, and ruin her business. And that's, unfortunately, back then in Hollywood, that's just the way things went. Women, women were not expected to, to speak up. Um, they were expected to be controlled by men, unfortunately. And it's now just another Hollywood tragedy that we're talking yeah. about. Um, and there are many Hollywood tragedies. There are many mysterious deaths. Uh, this has been riveting. And I would like to continue the conversation later on other, uh, focus on other mysterious deaths. And guys, this is where you can come in. Let us know what you think about this. This is, um, for me, this is fascinating. And I know for you as well. And uh, it's, it's, I think the best thing we can do under the circumstances is to watch and appreciate the work of Thelma Todd, because that lives on and it has lost nothing. It is still as wonderful as it ever was. So thank you for talking about this. Thank you for, for being our portal into this mystery, into this world, into the details around this, uh, this case. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. The more people know about Thelma Todd, the better. I want people to know who she is and I want people to watch her work. Where can people find you? Where can people keep up with what you're doing? So you can find me either on Twitter at Vanessa Butino or I have a blog, superbeebs.com. And I write all kinds of stuff on there, lifestyle, film and TV related, books related, all kinds of stuff. 
Uh, guys, I'm going to put all those links in the description of this video so you can just scroll down and click straight through. Um, and thank you guys for watching this video. We want to continue the conversation in these comments below. Uh, what do you think about this murder? What are your theories? And are there any other mysteries, untimely Hollywood deaths that you would like to see us turn our attention towards? Um, we want to keep this dialogue going because this is not, as we say, this is not uncommon in the golden age of Hollywood. So there's a lot of, a uh, lot of food for thought there. Um, Vanessa, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Take care. And until next time, we will catch you later.